Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Orlando, Florida for the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium, one of the most important gatherings uh, of the year for Air Force leaders, industry, thought leaders, as well as media uh, here in sunny Orlando. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS, and we're here at General Electric again to talk to Sean Warren, uh, who is uh, the Vice President for Large uh, Military Engines at General Electric, even though it's the turbofan, the Evandale turbofan and turbofan I went That's through correct. this with Carl Sheldon last year. I just think it's really, really cool. I'll go cool. by either title. Either you'll go by, you'll either go by either, either yes. title. Um, so B-52, obviously, uh, it's one of the one of the big talks of the show. Everybody is looking at the re-engineering uh, uh, program. Uh, you guys have uh, two bids um, that we discussed a little bit, uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about you know an update on that. So where does the program stand right now? Uh, you're the first interview uh, that we're doing on the, on the program, so give us a sense on where uh, that process is right now. No, great. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, so we are in the first stage of a two-step process. So over the next six to eight months, we're going to go work on an integration aspect. Uh, all the competitors will have an opportunity to study how their engines can integrate into the aircraft. And then from there, we'll go to a formal RFP. And uh, the thought is the Air Force would do a down select to uh, the final engine platform. So we have the privilege of having two different engines being offered in the competition. We have the CF-34-10, 26 million hours of uh, flight time, 1,600 engines in service, uh, proven reliability, I think we would say probably the lowest cost platform there. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the Passport engine, which just went into service in December on the Global 7500 program. But latest and greatest technology, best fuel burn in its class. It actually shares a lot of common technology with the LEAP platform, so it'll benefit from the learnings and the millions of hours of experience that the LEAP is getting as it goes in the service. And uh, when uh, is the in-service that the service is shooting for ballpark uh, to get the uh, to get the contract announced and to get a capability out there? Yeah, so I think they're looking at making a decision in the first half of next year for a final decision for engine selection. This program is actually on the list of programs for rapid acquisition under Dr. Roper's initiative. So that basically means we're in a sort of five-year time frame. So they're thinking in the 24 time frame that we would actually have product and service. Uh, that's uh, that's great. Um, so tell us a little bit about where you guys are. In, well, so how much of a fuel savings? So wh what are you telling the customer, or what are you telling the uh, the world about how much fuel efficiency you you have over the TF33, which is what so what's been uh, powering that aircraft for a long time? Yeah, great question. So modern engines obviously bring a lot of modern capability. I would say anywhere from 20 to 30 percent range, uh, depending on the engine that you're talking about, you can get that type of fuel efficiency there. So Passport obviously being closer to the 30% number. Right. Yeah. And, and also from a maintenance standpoint, right, you're looking at a much more modular engine design. Mm -hmm. So how much maintenance are you taking out uh, with each of your engines also by, by way of percentage as you make your case? Uh, so that way, that's actually not a <laughs> I don't I don't know that one. So I will say that the CF-34-10 is getting uh, 10,000 plus hours on wing. And actually, as we go look at e either platform, as it goes into the aircraft, we're expecting that the Air Force is never actually going to have to remove these engines. So once they install these, they should be able to go fly them throughout the life of the aircraft, which today is targeted at 2050. Um, how, uh, so it was interesting that in the conversation, there are some folks who are uh, making the case that digital flight controls actually will not work for an airplane like the B-52 because it's nuclear hardened and in order to be able to do it, you can't have any of these advanced digital features on the airplane. So what's your point, counterpoint to that kind of argumentation that a lot of these newer digital flight control engines are actually maybe might not be suited for an aircraft that has to be hardened for a nuclear operating? environment. Yeah, so I we don't see that in any way as a major stumbling block. We actually all assume it'll be part of the requirements that we have to go through some nuclear hardening assessments of the engines. It's something that has been done on other platforms before. It's a known level of scope, so in no way do we see that being a roadblock for any uh, putting a modern engine on an existing aircraft, even one as uh, experienced as the B-52. Yes. <laughs> Boy, that was an elegant way of putting it. Uh, a, a very mature airplane, <laughs> like the. Sure, that's airplane. even a better way. Yeah, that's it. And, uh, um, and and what's got the value of the contract, roughly, right? I mean, you know, the B-52 force is is not very large. Sixty-eight airplanes, uh, as I recall, or something. Also, and seventy-five to eighty aircraft. Yeah. So okay, we're. So I was thinking PAA. Yeah, but. yeah, right. So we're assuming it's probably six hundred plus engines is what the total buy would be for this program here. So. Right. And so, what would be the ballpark cost of that? You know, billions. Uh, 
um, hundreds I of think millions. the Air Force has talked about this being a total nine billion dollar kind of program, something in that range. Yeah. Right. And uh, and uh, so you're a fellow New Yorker. Uh, you're from Queens. Uh, Mets fan, I'm assuming. I am a Mets fan. Yes. A long-suffering yes. Mets fan. A long-suffering Mets. Hey, when I grew up, the Mets were really good. We had Dow Strawberry, Dwight Gooden. Those were the hate now. That's a long time ago, but yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I remember, even though I was a Yankee uh, fan growing up as a Manhattanite with a uh, grandmother in the Bronx, uh, all of our games we would go to, we were at Shea because my friend had a box over third base. So we would talk to oh. Frank Howard and Rusty Staub and all those guys uh, from, uh, yeah, it was, it was good times. 86 was a very, very good year because uh, mm -hmm. New York beat Boston oh, uh, great then. Year. Oh, it, it great was, year. It was a great year. And I like, I miss uh, Shea. I haven't been to City Field. So two, two questions. One, how do you like City Field and how do you think the Mets are going to do this year? So love City Field. It is an absolute great facility. I mean, I love Shea because when I was growing up, that was right. the stadium we went to. But City Field, uh, still great. How we're going to do this year, that's a, I think we're still very much in a rebuilding model right now. So, but they've got a lot of good young talent. So I think we're just trying to reload. So we're probably a few years away before really competing again. Well, as a sentimental favorite, I'll be pulling for the Mets anytime you guys get in there, unless it's you know against the Yankees or the or the Nationals. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Sean. Very really much. appreciate it. Best of luck on the program. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity.